Right. Hi guys, I'm Christina Warren. I'm the Senior Tech Analyst at Mashable, and this is Jason Seiken, who is the Senior Vice President at PBS Interactive. And we're going to be talking about uh, PBS's sort of digital transformation and, and some of the exciting things they're doing. But before we start, uh, PBS has prepared a brief little clip for us that shows off some of the power of PBS Digital Studios. Neighbor, I'd like to show you something. Never grow anything in the garden of your mind. You can grow ideas in the garden of your mind. It's good to be curious about many things. You can think about things and make believe. All you have to do is think and they'll grow. Here's an idea. Here's an idea. Instagram is the greatest thing to ever happen to photography. Bronies are changing the definition of masculinity. Dungeons and Dragons can make you a confident and successful person. You're kind of a melting pot of all these different aesthetics and styles and knowledge. It's a means of expression of how much they care about these things. My invention was the screw-in coffin. Welcome again to this neighborhood. So why don't you give us a little bit of background about what you know, the PBS Digital Studios is and how it came about. Sure, so PBS Digital Studios, and, and in particular the Mr. Rogers remix that you saw a little bit of there, it was one of those overnight sensations that was three or four or five years in the making. <laughs> and, and basically what I mean by that is PBS uh, three or four years ago faced a big business challenge. And I can probably illustrate it by the audience here. So how many of you grew up on PBS, watching PBS Kids and were fans of PBS? And how many of you still are kind of like PBS? And how many of those do you actually watch PBS? Right, so that's the, that's the challenge right there. The challenge was that we dominate on television in the up to age six, and then on television we get people age, you know, 55 plus, but that big donut hole in the middle we're missing. And we weren't capturing them online either. Uh, we were at about two million video streams a month three years ago. Now we're up to 165 million streams last month. Um, a big chunk of those on mobile. We, the kids space, um, according to Comscore at least, 46% uh, of all kids' video on all websites, on all kids' websites, is on pbskids.org. So that was, in terms of taking television uh, video, television production, linear television video, and moving it uh, to new distribution channels, that problem was solved. But we realized that that wasn't going to do it for us. We, there was, that wasn't going to solve the business challenge. So we decided we would do this Skunk Works project, and it had to be Skunk Works because you can see from this that this really isn't what the PBS kind of corporate identity stands for. We wanted to do it much different um, from, from what PBS television looks like. So we, we decided to create PBS Digital Studios, and from that we, we kind of did a couple the, our first couple experiments were bad television. It looked like television on a small screen. Then we realized that this, the, the, what we need to do is go away from what we do on television, do things that are really native to this medium. We call it PBS quality with a YouTube sensibility. And that's sort of where the Mr. Rogers remix came from, and that, that, that started things off. And, and obviously the Mr. Rogers remix uh, was a huge hit. It went viral immediately. I, I know that when I was received the email, you know, from PBS letting me know about it, I was immediately in love and, and had I, you, I couldn't write it fast enough. And it was one of those stories that our audience loved, and and the successive ones that you've done have also worked really well. Um, what type of impact has that had on on some of your, your other digital initiatives and in terms of your your YouTube subscription base? Well, you're right. It really it shot to the top of YouTube. It's most viewed. It has about twenty two thousand uh, comments. So it really, it really shook people up in terms of their expectations of PBS. If you look at the comments, those 22,000 comments, they kind of fall into a couple categories. One is, I can't believe I cried man tears over this. <laughs> and the other is, I can't believe this is an official PBS production. So the success of it sort of gave us liberty. It gave us license to continue down this non-conventional path, to really go 
against what our brand stands for in, on television. And it, it also, it, it was a dual-edged sword because it, it got people excited about the possibility of web original video and doing it in a new way. But it also got people a little bit scared in, in terms of, you know, before that hit, we were doing this under the radar. It was a Skunk Works project. After the hit, we couldn't keep it secret anymore, and we really had to, you know, focus on changing the culture and getting the culture of PBS more, um, you know, more comfortable with the idea of, of doing things radically in a radically different way. So how do you do that? How do you change the culture? It, good question. And there's no simple answer, but we found that there's a couple of keys, at least in our case there were a couple of keys. One is uh, to, to do things both in a radical way, but in an incremental way. So what I tell the staff is if you want to start a revolution, we want to start a revolution, but we start with an insurrection. And the reason for that is you need to, you know, you need to be radical. You need to have a bold, big idea because that's what's going to inspire you. It's what's going to inspire the staff. But at the same time, if you try to shove that bold change down the corporate throat, you're going to die. Uh, so you have to start, you have to spoon feed it. And what we started with three years ago was our video platform, which was kind of uh, a local national video platform. And what was the radical piece of it was that it was the, the, the UI, the, 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 the design, the front end. Uh, which was very much anti-PBS or against the, again, against the PBS brand. Um, it was, in, in fact, the, my, my favorite anecdote is we had a, in the focus groups before, uh, before launch, a 60, 65-year-old woman looked at it, played with it, and said, this isn't at all what I expected from PBS. It's so modern. <laughs> and, and then people were tweeting, and somebody tweeted, this is sick nasty, <laughs> uh, which, you know, when's the last time you heard sick nasty associated with PBS? But, <laughs> but the, the key was we were able to get away with that. We were able to get away with a, a radical front end because the back end really served a key stakeholder. It served our stations. It, it was a local national back end that they could tap into. So you can get away with a lot if, if there's something in it in, this, you know, in, your, in your experiment, if there's something in it for your key stakeholder. So you, you talked about how you were able to do that with the existing content that you put online. Right. How are you guys going to do that when it comes to creating digital-only content, and as you've had success with Idea Channel and, and, and some of you know, the, these other initiatives? What are you going to be doing to work with the, the, the local networks, right. local stations? Right. It, it's, it's very analogous, same, thing, same approach, because, again, it's, it's sort of a little bit threatening to the corporate body of, to, to come out with a channel, a digital channel, that doesn't follow, you know, when I look at web originals from a lot of uh, traditional companies there, and there are, there's, you know, there's, this isn't the rule. I mean, the New York Times now is doing auto-tuned uh, <laughs> stuff. I, I like to think that they're following in our footsteps. But for the most part, you know, the traditional media companies are doing traditional stuff, traditional video, only shorter, you know. And we tried that, you know, we put up, we took a nature video and we, on you know birds, and we got the cute little baby bird falling out of the nest uh, and surviving in a minute and a half. But that's not what works. It's not just shortening it; it's doing it in a in a new with a new production approach. So, but that's threatening to. That's not the way we've always done things. Uh, so again, we we the way we get around that and get the permission to do that is by making sure that there's a, a big payoff for our, big, our stakeholders, the stations. So what we're going to do, or what we've been doing, is not just launch these national productions like Idea Channel, uh, but also have, uh, we're working with the stations, about 30 or 40 of our stations, for them to do this style production in their local markets with local people uh, around local issues. And then that, the advantage of that is that not only can their local community see it on, on the website and possibly even syndicated back to TV, but people in other markets can discover it too. Exactly. So kind of the same way that the many of us discovered radio shows of public radio because of podcasting, people can now discover maybe local you know, flavors of things happening because of YouTube. Right. It, it becomes this, you know, self, this virtuous cycle where they're, they're doing local productions. They're all in the PBS Digital Studios network on YouTube. So they benefit every time we have a Mr. Rogers type hit, and we've done three of them now, and we haven't announced this publicly, so 
I'll tweet it if you want. But, we're, we're breaking news, guys. <laughs> breaking news. Uh, the next in the series, the fourth in the series, is coming on Monday morning um, in the remixes. So Be sure to look, keep an eye out. We'll have it on Mashable. It'll be on a PBS's YouTube channel Monday morning. That's going to be a good one. Right. So as you know, anytime we have a hit like that nationally, it, it's, it helps the local stations in their productions because they, the, the audience that we have on, on national, we can drive to local. So one of the, the stats, and we kind of glossed over this, and, and I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to kind of highlight this because I think this is so fascinating. You guys do, what, like 163 million streams a month according to, to, to Comscore, and 63% of those streams are coming from mobile and tablets. Yep, and, it's, you know, and, and most of those are from our iOS apps, our iPhone and iPad apps, and, and we've got three of them, one for, oh, four of them actually, so two for grown-ups, two for kids, actually one for kids, it's a, it's a unified app, it's a universal app. And kids are just devouring the iPad in particular. We're seeing probably about a three to one, even though the penetration of the iPhone is so much higher, we're seeing about a three to one uh, video, more video usage on the iPad, and about a almost 10 to one kids versus adults. So just a huge amount, I think it's 90 to 100 million streams uh, last month on our iPad, iPhone app for kids. <laughs> they're, just, they're just voracious consumers of, um, of the tablet. And that's so amazing to me, and I guess the reason I, I pointed that out is that, as, as you said at the, the top of the program, you know, the big challenge you guys faced is how do you reach the people in this audience? Right. How do you get them to continue to look at PBS as, as a brand and a place to go to for content? And I think a big reason how you do that is not just by creating digital first and, and, and web ready content, but already having it ingrained in the next generation of viewers to immediately and expect to go and watch content and consume it on a, on a phone or tablet. And the fact that such a huge portion of, of your audience is already doing that, I think speaks really highly to the potential success you'll have as those viewers mature yeah. and, and age up. Yeah, so like, like I bet everybody else in the room has gone mobile first, we have too, but particularly you know, mobile first on steroids for kids because they're moving away from the television rapidly and they're moving to mobile uh, very, very rapidly. They're, they're looking for, you know, they're very comfortable with the mobile uh, format. They're very comfortable with tablets. My, you know, my five-year-old picked it up in 20 minutes and it was, you know, what, what takes me 20 days to pick up as he did in 20 minutes. So it's, for anybody who's trying to attract a younger audience, and particularly a, you know, sort of, um, you know, preschool th up through teens, it's mobile is, and, and tablets are the way to go. Well, Jason, thank you so much. Thank and uh, all of you guys, uh, stay tuned for the next remix video. It'll be premiering on Monday.